Yeah, three is the long one. Three, good luck. Hey, Bandit, good luck, bro. Three is a long chapter. Yes, yes it was. Hello friends on the internet and welcome back to the lore of every Black Myth Wukong boss, or if it's your first time here, welcome. And a very special hello to all of you who came over from Afro Senju. If that's you, say hey in the comments. And a huge thank you right off the bat, of course, to the man, the myth, the legend himself, Afro Senju. Seriously man, if you're watching this, I really appreciate you taking the time to check out my humble lore breakdowns on your channel. In this video, we'll be focusing on the bosses of Chapter 3 of the game called White Snow, Ice Cold, which you probably already knew since the title of the video is Chapter 3. If you've missed the explanations of the first two chapters though, please feel free to check out those videos after you're done here. I'll have them linked in the description below. Real quick before we get into this video, I once again have a minor correction to make regarding a connection I mistakenly made in Chapter 2. The father and son of Stone's characters are actually not the Shingandang and Stone Vanguard bosses at all. That was just straight up incorrect since those characters actually are bosses but from the later chapters. How did I make such a mistake you might ask? Well, you'd be surprised what slips through the cracks when you're reading multiple novels worth of Chinese mythology as backstories to the game. Sometimes you forget what's in the game. Anyway, I wanted to let you know about that correction with the previous video, but enough about my mistakes. Let's move on to the bosses of chapter 3, which have been triple checked for accuracy. Trust me, I'm a professional. Just like the other videos, we'll be starting with the minor, disconnected bosses, and we'll choose one boss in particular to explain all the others. In this case, the monk Yellowbrow, who, like the other chapter bosses, had a hand in pretty much everything to do with Chapter 3, as well as making a villainous appearance in Chapters 64 and 65 of the original novel, Journey to the West. Right off the bat, I want to once again remind you that another, separate video will be coming out in the not-too-distant future regarding the frog and dragon bosses in the game, of which Chapter 3 does indeed add to the frog Long Ligo Long and the dragon Cyan Long, so for now, we'll just skip right past these two and go straight to one of the most random boss encounters in the chapter, the old Jinseng Gwai. Now, if you've played the game, then you are no stranger to some plants and roots actually springing up from the ground as Yao Guais, which then attempt to end your existence with violence. Each type of these plant Guais have their own backstories and reasons for being alive, but the ones that possibly pertain to the old Jinseng Guai would naturally most likely be the other Jinseng Guais, known as the Jinsenglings. According to their backstory, even the normal ginseng roots that are just growing in the ground chilling are aware of their surroundings and can even hear the footsteps of human ginseng harvesters coming along to scoop them up. It's also notable that ginseng roots appear to have human-like shapes, which we'll get back to in just a second. One day, while harvesters came to collect some ginseng, there just was a ginseng ling Yao Guai that appeared, threatening to kill one of these harvesters, and apparently having already killed at least one other human whose skeleton was seen by the harvester. It can be assumed that the old Jinseng Guai is therefore just simply one of the older Jinseng Lings that has grown to be bigger and more powerful and even more intelligent than all the others. In the case of this old Jinseng Guai, it was fed grand meals by a family that lived very long lives in the mountains and, out of gratitude for the shared food, even showcased the ability to recognize that one of the humans, the Great Grandmother, needed healing when she was terminally ill with typhoid fever. It grew a millennium Jinseng and made it into a soup, which healed the Great Grandmother entirely upon consumption and granted her life even to this day. Now this begs the question, if the old Jin Seng Gwai is so kind and benevolent to some people, why does he immediately try to kill the destined one upon meeting him? Personally, I think this is as simple as the family that lived in the mountains always showed respect to the old Gwai and never went out to harvest ginseng roots themselves. The destined one, on the other hand, tries to pluck the old ginseng Gwai out of the ground, which the ginsengs are clearly not big fans of. As far as what made all the ginseng roots come to life in the first place, I think it may have something to do with the story from Journey to the West that entails Sun Wukong destroying a ginseng tree, which is due to an entire other storyline which in turn caused the magical ginseng fruits which just so happened to be shaped like pre-born infants to fall to the ground. The ending animation for the game showcases this as sprouting other ginseng plants, which could possibly be the literal living guys we see today, but hey, that's just a theory. Anyway, next up is the Yin Tiger, who is an optional boss in the game and isn't even really an enemy. He's actually the smith of the Zodiacs, who all reside in Zodiac Village, and oh yeah, did I mention they're all Zodiacs? In case you didn't know, the Chinese Zodiac is composed of 12 animals, which were all selected long ago by the Jade Emperor as the 12 beings from the mortal realm to win a race and cross the Divine Gate. Four of these Zodiac animals, the Monkey, Dog, Dragon, and Tiger, are present right here, and due to their closeness with the Monkey King in his life, were all sentenced 
sensed by the sacred divinity, also known as Erlang Shen, for super top secret reasons to be revealed in the chapter 6 video, make sure you're subscribed to be here when that drops by the way, to descend back to the mortal realm and assist the destined one on his journey, from their retreat within the Ruyi Scroll, which is also an artifact given to them by Erlang. The Yin Tiger is simply available to fight the destined one as a challenge if we so choose, and should you be successful in conquering the fatal feline, he will reward the destined one with his weapon which allows us to transform into him as well as unlock a legendary set of armor for crafting. The tiger is known as the Yin Tiger because of the Yin Yang symbolism, where the white tiger represents the Yin or Earth side of the universe, and the dragon represents the Yang or Heaven side. And the Yin Tiger isn't the only zodiac animal boss we fight in chapter 3 either. The other is the dragon known as Chen Long, who you actually end up kind of feeling bad for after you, you know, beat the daylight out of him. But he doesn't seem too shaken up by the defeat, and once beaten, asks you to grab a pill from his pal Su Dog so that he can feel better. The dog seems to acknowledge Chen Long's temper, but also says that he's probably fine, and after you bring the pill back to the dragon, he throws the pill aside, just happy that you did what he asked. Then he hands you the Ruyi scroll, and he, along with all the other zodiacs, head on inside. Chen Long acts as the gardener of the zodiac village, and you never have to beat him up again. The next minor boss we'll talk about would be a giant golden Apramana bat, which is a bit of a different Yao Guai in that it's actually a living statue that eats people, and also grants wishes. Interestingly enough, the Apramana bats, as well as several of the Yaguai chiefs in this chapter, were based off of real-life Buddhist statues coming from the Iron Buddha Temple in the county city of Gaoping. There's actually a pretty neat website I found that points out a lot of the similarities for these bosses, which I will link to in the description if you're interested in reading. The website is in Chinese though, so you'll have to use a browser that can translate it to English if you can't read Chinese. Anyway, regardless of the inspiration behind the design, this particular Apramana bat, or one just like it, apparently used to be worshipped by mountain-dwelling villagers, who had built a large temple to house it in, as well as several smaller temples for the smaller Apramanabat statues. One day, a traveling swordsman took shelter in one of these smaller tempu- one day, a traveling swordsman took shelter in one of these smaller temples that had a smaller bat statue in it, only for it to spring to life as a Yao Guai when he was trying to sleep. He was able to kill it, and in the morning, the villagers gathered around and asked him to rid the other temples of all the other Apramana Bat Yao Guai statues in exchange for some money. The swordsman agreed, and after this they led him to the main temple with the main golden Apramana Bat inside, which came to life, froze him in place before he could run away, then dragged him to the back of the temple, assumedly to be devoured. Immediately though, the village knelt down and made wishes, and in the morning, everything they had wished for came true. Meaning it was by design that the swordsman would be a sacrifice to the golden Apramanabat statue the whole time. So that's fun. The next boss we'll talk about is known as the Green-Capped Martialist, and is also the next brother involved in the Erlang Shen mystery quest that we'll be mostly getting to in Chapter 6, with the previous brothers being the Yellow-Robed Squire in Chapter 2 and the White-Clad Noble in Chapter 1. Just like the previous two, he appears in the story in order to test the Destined One by combat, and has the least amount of personality out of the three so far only really bothering to speak when issuing insults. After their fight, the green-capped martialist disappears into thin air, and the destined one is then granted an audience with a little monk known as Maitreya, who's actually a bodhisattva, and is known both in game and in real life as the Buddha of the future. And no, I'm not talking about this little guy who happens to look the exact same. We'll get to him in just a sec. Fun fact, what Maitreya does regarding using melon juice to write a magic spell on the palm of the destined one is incredibly similar to what he does to Sun Wukong in the novel, although it was for a different one-time use spell used directly to subdue Yellowbrow. And speaking of Yellowbrow, it's time to start explaining his backstory and weave the remaining bosses into it as we go along. You'll see that he actually has a lot of similarities to the previous chapter boss, the Yellow Wind Sage, in that he's a recurring villain who first appeared in the novel, and he served his own bodhisattva but broke free trying to make his own way outside of the will of the Buddha. In Journey to the West, we discover that Yellowbrow used to be a servant of the Bodhisattva Maitreya, alongside another man known as Jin Chanzi. As many people have already figured out, and as you could probably figure out for yourself after beating Yellowbrow in combat, the washed up, sea turtle looking creature with yellow eyebrows from the deep yet disturbing chapter ending animation is in fact Yellowbrow himself, and we can even see his fellow student Jin Chanza appear on screen at the end, who's actually the previous incarnation of the monk Tan Sangzong, the very same monk who leads Sun Wukong and co on the journey to the west. Small world, I know. We don't know too much about Yellowbrow's time serving under Maitreya, aside from the fact that he apparently used to engage in several bets with Jin Chanza regarding the true nature of humanity. Yellowbrow believed human beings to be innately selfish, having a tendency to evade 
eventually look out for only themselves with no regard to any moral code, able to commit any act, no matter how evil, in the interest of self-gain. Jinchanza refuted Yellowbrow's claims, and as such, experiments such as the one we witness in the animation were performed by Yellowbrow. In this case, he became a washed-up sea turtle-like monster that was taken in by a poor fishing village. He made it very clear that his bodily materials could bring about everything the fishes could ever want. Riches, health, and plenty of food. However, the only way to get the precious pearls and jade and other materials of wealth out of his body was to pierce his skin, which again he made very sure that the villagers knew. He became their deity, feasting on as much food as he wanted while allotting riches little by little to the villagers. Before long, however, the thoughts of just overpowering the turtle creature and dismembering him forcefully in order to take all of his riches at once began to fester in the minds of the people, which is exactly what Yellowbrow wanted to happen to prove his point. In a very quickly animated reveal, Yellowbrow looked at one man in particular and actually pulled him by the vest towards his own body, placing the man in a gold crazed daze, resulting in the man taking out his own dagger and carving a deep wound into the flesh of Yellowbrow. The effect snowballed immediately, and the villagers ran wild with dismembering the body of the creature completely, with no regard to each other, even their own children. Yellowbrow looked out at the crazed villagers and couldn't help but smile, since this is what he wanted to happen after all. Monks gave gave up their morals and had their way with women, and murderous violence even broke out over the possession of the eyeballs of the creature. Upon the corpse of what they once worshipped as a god, men now urinated. They then burnt the corpse and left by the morning, which is when the mercilessly ravaged body of Yellowbrow, staring listlessly across the sea, was quietly approached by Jinchanza, who was not yet a mortal being at this point. Yellowbrow explains that this proved the true, selfish nature of humanity, while Jinchanza argued that Yellowbrow created the result himself by manipulating the villagers, claiming that he sowed chaos in their hearts purposefully and called it absurd and pathetic. Yellowbrow was not convinced of this though, and thus the two of them never really saw eye to eye on the nature of humanity, something that Yellowbrow even speaks about once again when we finally meet him at the end of the chapter. However, due to his many teachings that we can hear about in the game, we know that Yellowbrow might have held to this belief because he himself wanted it to be true. His entire philosophy in the game is that self-worshipping and self-bettering, or in very simple terms, selfishness is the true way to enlightenment, and one can become a Buddha by oneself without any regard to the welfare of others. This belief was the root cause behind all of his actions throughout the remainder of his life. In the novel, we know that eventually he decided to steal two powerful artifacts from his master, the Bodhisattva Maitreya, one being a pair of giant, magical golden symbols that create airtight seals and can never be separated, and the other being the magical sack that is simply referred to as the human sack in the novel, with the ability to completely strip magical power from those held prisoner inside. In the novel, he then ran away from the service of the Bodhisattva and decreed himself to be a Buddha, even going so far as to establish another thunderclap temple and call it the small or new thunderclap temple in an area he called the New West. The original grand thunderclap temple, by the way, is literally the destination of Tang Sanzang's journey to the West, which is actually why the pilgrim group decided to stop there on their way, even though Sun Wukong strongly recommended against it. When the group entered in, they bowed before the quote-unquote Buddha a Yellowbrow, but Wukong's fiery golden eyes allowed him to see through the ruse and he immediately called out Yellowbrow on the act after which Yellowbrow immediately traps Wukong inside of the golden symbols, which he could do nothing to escape from. And yes, these are the very same golden symbols that we find Zhu Baja inside of in the game. Yellowbrow then ties up all the other members of the group in the back of the temple, and there's no mention in the book of him recognizing his old friend Jin Chanzi at this point, but we know that due to him knowing about Sun Zhang's journey in the game, there must have been some sort of recognition that happened at this point. Either way, Wukong was fortunately able to summon some help in the middle of the night when all the enemies were sleeping from within the symbols which came at the decree of the Jade Emperor in the form of the 28 constellation deities, sometimes also referred to as the mansions in Chinese mythology. This is actually where the first mention of Kang Jin Star or Kang Jin Long happens, the golden constellation of the Eastern Azure Dragon symbol, appearing in her dragon form. Although for some reason she's referred to in the novel as a he, though this might just be a translation thing. In the book, she saved Wukong's life by shrinking down until her horn was the size of a sewing needle, using it to pierce inside the crease of the golden symbols and then growing larger hoping to split them apart just enough for Wukong to also shrink down and escape. However, the edges of the magical symbols just formed around her horn, acting more like flesh than gold, and leaving no gaps. 
Being a rather smart monkey though, Wukong then decided to just drill into her horn, shrink down and insert himself inside it, then ask her to pull the horn out, which she does with some effort successfully bringing Wukong out as well, who immediately destroys the symbols. This woke Yellowbrow and Co. up and they all engaged in combat at once. However, Yellowbrow scooped the Monkey King and all the constellations up in his magic bag, which sapped their powers and left them emaciated. He then brought them back out and tied them up with the others, but after they were left alone again, Wukong was able to easily shrink himself out of his bindings and therefore release everyone else. Long story short, right before they were all able to leave, Wukong decided to go back inside to grab Sung Zung's luggage, which Kong Jin's star, the Golden Dragon, scolded him for, calling him materialistic. He then accidentally dropped the luggage, woke everyone up, Yellowbrow's forces found the constellations and pilgrim group and once again bagged them all. This time except for Wukong, who was able to escape. At this point, he led a series of recruitment escapades where he would plead to various deities for help, the first of which was the powerful god Zen Wu, the true warrior of the north, who as a side note had two generals serving under him, the turtle general and the snake general, both of which appear in the game, one of which is a skeleton. Zen Wu couldn't help himself out of fear of offending the Jade Emperor, but in his stead, he sent the turtle and snake and five divine dragon deities down with Wukong to battle Yellowbrow, all of which got sucked up in the quite overpowered magic bag, again leaving only Wukong to escape. The monkey then left to get more help from Sizo Mountain, which is where he met Prince Littlezang, also known as the third prince of the flowing sands which I mentioned in the chapter 2 video. In the novel, he had left his home because he was ill, but in the game, it appears that there was more to the story and he left his home behind because of all the rat drama going on. And for more on all that rat business, check out my previous boss lore video. Anyway, Prince Littlezang had under his command four divine warriors, referred to as his captains, all of which we meet in the game, but we'll get to that in just a bit. Once again, everyone who assaulted Yellowbrow was captured inside the magic bag, once again, except for Wukong. The Monkey King was exasperated and felt like he was running out of options, but just then, the Bodhisattva Maitreya himself appeared to Wukong and assumed the responsibility for the current state of affairs. He then decided to propose a plan. If Wukong could lead Yellowbrow down out of the New Thunderclap Temple and into a melon field using a captivating spell that he drew in Wukong's palm, then Wukong could turn into a melon and Matria, disguised as a melon farmer, would offer that melon that was really soon Wukong to Yellowbrow for his quote-unquote enjoyment. This plan worked swimmingly and Yellowbrow did indeed not only follow the pesky monkey down to the melon field, but he also chomped down on the melon that was actually Wukong, the Wukellen, or the Melong. Anyway, once inside, Wukong pulled a similar method he used with the Black Bear Guai from Chapter 1 and proceeded to beat the literal crap out of Yellowbrow's insides, which ultimately caused Yellowbrow to surrender to his master, relinquishing the magical bag. Matria then stuffed Yellowbrow into the bag and restored and reclaimed his golden symbols. The rest of Yellowbrow's followers in the New Thunderclap Temple fled and or were killed by Wukong, and everyone that was captured by Yellowbrow was then released, which includes the constellations and Little Prince Zhang along with his four captains. The prince also knew at this time that his home kingdom of the Flowing Sands was no longer plagued by the Yellow Wind Sage, so he decided to stay on Sizou Mountain and resume his training. Now fast forward to the death of Sun Wukong. Yellowbrow was released from his captivity mysteriously and involved in the killing of the Monkey King mysteriously, and as a result was given the third relic of Sun Wukong, the hubris nose for safekeeping. After this, he mirrored his previous actions from the novel and once again stole the exact same two relics from Bodhisattva Maitreya, the golden symbols and the annoyingly OP magic bag, which combined with Wukong's relic became even more superpowered and gained the ability to snatch up mortal souls as well. He then went right back to the same spot he was in from the novel as well, the small or new Thunderclap Temple, where he once again proclaimed himself to be a Buddha, but this time under the shape-shifted disguise as his master Maitreya himself. Which I don't know about for you, but for me, was very confusing the first time I was going through chapter 3. Anyway, after he had his grand second debut, this time as the Buddha of the future himself, he decided to host a grand ceremony and send out invites to pretty much everyone, Yao Guais and deities and other Buddhas alike, which gained a lot of attention and attracted many different individuals to the new Thunderclap Temple, many of which were recruited by Yellowbrow into his ranks. One such individual was the Macaque Chief, who actually used to be allied with Sun Wukong as one of the original Seven Sages, which, just in case you didn't know, was a fraternity group established by Wukong long ago for the seven most powerful of the animal Yao Guai kings in defiance of the Celestial Court. Sun Wukong was the greatest of them, and therefore he named himself the Great Sage equal to heaven, while the Macaque Chief named himself the Telltale Great Sage. 
After their meeting, Yellowbrow performed a miracle and temporarily healed the macaque's black wings, which made the macaque very happy. After this, he basically just offered the macaque a nice place to stay where he'd be treated with respect and honestly, that's all the macaque really wanted, so allied with Yellowbrow he became. As other monks flocked to New Thunderclap to study under the quote-unquote Buddha of the future, one such monk was far superior in hand-to-hand -hand combat than any of the others, while also being fervently against killing of any kind. After a debate with Yellowbrow regarding the morality behind killing, which ended with Yellowbrow unable to formulate a response to the monk due to the latter's superior logic, Yellowbrow instructed the monk's hands to be tied behind his back and for him to kneel in front of the stone wall outside the temple, meditating on his words, hoping that eventually the monk would come around to agreeing with Yellowbrow. This monk was known as non-able and was indeed eventually convinced that killing was a necessary evil, though the first person they ever tried to kill was unfortunately the destined one, who instead killed the monk. Another notable monk under Yellowbrow's leadership, known as non-pure, was physically also very powerful, but very lazy. So lazy that he wouldn't even go out to meet an intruder and sent his underlings to do it instead after being repeatedly asked by his underlings to intervene. And that is literally all we know about him. Honestly though, I can kind of relate. Anyway, another of Yellowbrow's followers, a Yao Guai chief known as Non White, was originally an actor from the far off village of Tuolo, who was tired of always playing the role of the jester and just wanted a chance at playing the hero for once. His fellow cast members wouldn't let him though, so one time he decided to just change the play on the spot and beat up the main hero actor on stage, assuming the role of the hero himself, which obviously nobody liked. Non White couldn't understand why nobody liked this new act though, so he decided to do the next logical thing and, you know, kill the main actor and cut off his face and wear the main actor's face on his face and then perform like that. Which, you know, ironically nobody liked either. After which he was tied up and sent to New Thunderclap Temple, which was a thousand miles away for seclusion. Yellowbrow thought his story was just wonderful and even cultivated a new combat art just for him, which involved the combination of frost and poison. He then named Non White Non White and told him that eventually a true hero known as the Destined One would be coming along and if he could wear the face of this true hero monkey, then he himself would finally become a true hero like he always wanted. And so it was that people were terrified of the mountain path, guarded by Non White, the face carver, who would lurk along the path waiting for the Destined One. Eventually though, he is put down by the Destined One, and there was much rejoicing. The final non-named boss under Yellowbrow's leadership would be Non-Void, the most senior of all of Yellowbrow's followers, who we've actually seen before in the uniquely animated Snow Fox cutscene. I'm sure you've already seen it, but just in case you haven't, there was a young monk in the animation that was traveling to where I can only assume is the new Thunderclap Temple, since he's traveling in snowy mountains. And eventually he stumbled upon a trapped Snow Fox. This fox, mind you, was an earnest female spirit who wanted to learn the ways of humanity and study Buddhism alongside us in order to achieve enlightenment and become a magnificent fox goddess and was well on her way by the time she was caught in a trap. The young monk saved her from this trap and brought her into a nearby cabin, where he bandaged her and gave her water to drink. However, overnight, he dreamed that the fox turned into a beautiful woman and the two of them fell in love and had an entire extended family over the next several years. But one day, in in the future, his wife turned into a terrifying fox Yao Guai and ate their children and grandchildren. Even though this was just a nightmare, when he awoke from it, instead of healing and releasing the innocent snow fox like he was going to do initially, he then decided to kill her, skin her, and wear her fur as a scarf around his neck, eventually making it to the new Thunderclap temple and giving the scarf away to someone else. He was seemingly unfazed by his murder of the Snow Fox, until one day when he debated fellow disciple Non Abel about the morality of killing, which apparently was Non Abel's favorite subject. Non Abel was able to once again stump his debate opponent with logic by drawing the simple conclusion of the justification behind killing being the real sin, which led to Non Void avoiding a debate with Non Abel for the rest of their lives. The Destined One can stumble upon the Snow Fox's scarf and actually communicate with her spirit, who asks the Destined One if he could lead her spirit to her old savior slash murderer, Non Void, who she knew was in New Thunderclap. If the Destined One successfully leads the Fox Spirit to Non Void, he immediately recognizes her and reveals that he actually was dealing with the guilt of her murder this entire time, claiming that he prayed for years that she would find peace. However, this sweet moment is cut short by his determination to kill her again, which of course is unsuccessful since the Destined One has something to say about it this time around. As he dies, he finally reveals that he understands he brought this chain of guilt upon himself, and the Snow Fox can finally move on, giving us the Snow Fox Brush Curio for our help. 
As a side note, remember that Yellowbrow was once a student of the Bodhisattva Maitreya alongside Tang Sanzang. Like I mentioned earlier, he proves, especially at the end of the chapter, that he was very familiar with Sanzang's entire journey to the west, as well as specifically the disciples he kept at his side, such as his horse, Bai Long Ma, or White Dragon Horse in English, his monkey, Sun Wukong, or Awakened to Void in English, his pig, Zubaja, also known as Zhu Wunang, or Aware of Ability in English, and his final disciple, Sha Wujing, or Aware of Purity in English. This is why Yellowbrow, who made his legacy by mimicking those around him, named his top four disciples non-white, non-void, non-able, and non-pure, out of spite of the disciples of Tang Sangzang, which I thought was a pretty cool detail. There was also one other rather strange monk that Yellowbrow recruited at some point as he was crossing the Bitter Lakes on a ferry. After he had docked at his destination, he turned around to see several He Lo fishes, which are mythological fish that have one head and ten bodies and bark like a dog. The fishes all hated living in the Bitter Lakes, so he took them in and taught them how to transform into humans as well as many of his wonderful teachings. One of these transformed Hilo fishes, known as the Monk from the Sea, was straight up violent for no reason and constantly tried to post up and attack and kill everyone he saw, especially including Yellowbrow himself, who was always pretty amused at the attempts. Eventually the fish monk learned how to throw snowballs with deadly accuracy, literally, and the very impressed Yellowbrow who was almost killed himself by said snowballs, then assigned the monk from the sea the position of inner courtyard cleaner, which allowed the crazy violent fish guy to ambush anyone it wanted, including the destined one who kills the fishy dude and earns a transformation as a reward. While Yellowbrow was busy on this recruiting spree, eventually the whispers of this grand affair in the New West reached the ears of Prince Little Zung, who headed back out to the New Thunderclap Temple to figure out what was going on slash kill Yellowbrow, along with his four captains. However, he and his four mighty captains were once again defeated by Yellowbrow and his magic bag, with Captains Wise Voice and Lotus Vision convinced to join Yellowbrow's side, Captain Culpa Wave decapitated and turned into a blood lotus monster, and Captain Void Illusion mutilated and physically rearranged until death, which is probably just as horrifying as it sounds. In his imprisonment, the third Prince of Flowing Sands unfortunately began to go mad. The three still living captains can be encountered and defeated by the Destined One, after which their souls can be retrieved and returned to Prince Little Zung, who we can find in a cell, who awards us with the Chubai Spearhead before returning to his cell, completely defeated in spirit. He claims that he can now finally return home, and he is gone by the next time you check on him, although I'm not sure if he pops up anywhere else in the game after this point. If you've found him, let me know in the comments below. Meanwhile, one of the very powerful constellation deities, known as the Dawn Star, or in the novel as the Sun Rooster, went missing. So Kang Jin Star, assuming Yellowbrow had something to do with this, decided to go to Yellowbrow's grand event in order to look for the Dawn Star. And by the way, the Dawn Star does actually appear in the next chapter as a boss, so more on him in a later video. In reality though, Kang Jin was actually just using this investigation as an excuse to search for the also recently disappeared Wukong, that she correctly suspected Yellowbrow had something to do with. Upon confronting Yellowbrow though, she was defeated, since apparently no one can beat this guy, and subsequently sucked into his bag. Where she saw firsthand Wukong's hubris nose relic in its ten-tailed goldfish form. She was then released and asked Yellowbrow if all the other deities were like this, which Yellowbrow said nothing to, and this apparently convinced her to join his side. I can only assume she thought that this meant that Yellowbrow was more powerful than Wukong and was able to defeat, capture, and transform him into the fish she saw in the bag, surrendering to the power of Yellowbrow, but that's my own personal interpretation. Either way, she then surrenders entirely to the will of Yellowbrow and is even encountered and fought by the Destined One on Yellowbrow's behalf twice. Once in her dragon form right after leaving the bag, and once in her humanoid form as we stumble across her taunting the captured Zubaja, who was captured in the same manner in the same golden symbols as Sun Wukong was years ago. After the second fight with Kang Jin, she transforms into her dragon form and the Destined One pulls a badass and jumps on her back, literally steering her into the golden symbols, splitting them apart as her horn pierces them one last time. She then passes away after this, ending her life by inadvertently saving Sun Wukong in the same manner once more. 
With all the other bosses out of the way, the Destined One then fights his way up to Yellowbrow directly and, after some philosophical debate and a nice old-fashioned fight, ends up getting sucked into the bag just like Soon Wukong before him. Inside, we once again encounter the Macaque Chief, who we finally get to actually kill alongside Zubaja, who has also been in here for who knows how long. After the Macaque's defeat, and having obtained his weapon, the Destined One transforms into the Macaque, but Yellowbrow uses his magic to lock the Destined One into this transformation, pulling him out of his bag and placing him in his tiny form in his Mahavira Hall, where he attempts to goad the Destined One into becoming like him, and slaughtering an unlimited number of people in order to forcefully achieve quote-unquote enlightenment and Buddhahood through bloodshed. The literal picture of taking from others to advance yourself. Eventually, Yellowbrow himself joins the Destined One at the end of Mahavira Hall and is finally defeated. He runs out of the hall into the same frozen lake where we first met, known as Miramir, Mirror, and falls through the ice, sinking down deep into the water, never to be seen again. After this, Matria shows up and reclaims his magic bag, then fishes out Wukong's fishy relic, now in the form of the ten-tailed goldfish. And that officially wraps up the entire lore behind every single boss in Chapter 3 of Black Myth Wukong. If you're still hearing my voice right now, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you thought in the comments below as well as if there's any lore I missed or got wrong. And please consider leaving a like if you enjoyed the watch or at least my efforts into making it. Once again, sorry for the amount of time these videos take to make, but there is a lot that goes into making them and I do want to make sure I get everything right. We're only halfway done with all the amazing bosses in this game, so if you're looking forward to the rest of them as much as I am, please make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you aren't already to be here when they drop. Huge thanks as always to my bandit crew and and if you're interested in supporting these videos and helping them get made quicker, feel free to check out the ways you can support the channel in the description below. That's all I've got for this one, so follow me on my socials and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. This is Bandit, signing out. Peace!